Good morning, everyone. My name is Caitlin Yeager, Director of Heritage Programs for Missouri Humanities. Our mission is to enrich lives and strengthen communities by connecting Missourians with the people, places, and ideas that shape our society. Thank you so much for joining us today for Chapter 6 of Explore Missouri's German Heritage, an eight-part program series that delves into each chapter of the book of the same title by W. Arthur Merhoff. The series will continue every second Thursday of the month at 10 a.m. through April. The book is available for purchase. I'll be posting the link to buy the book in the chat box on Zoom and in the comments on the Facebook Live video if you are joining us on Facebook. They are $25 each and all proceeds will help us continue to bring free public programs such as these to Missourians. Whether you are joining us on Zoom or watching on Facebook Live, we invite you to be part of the conversation. If you're on Facebook, feel free to comment, let us know you're watching and ask questions for us to consider. And if you're on Zoom, feel free to submit your questions throughout the program using either the chat feature or the Q&A feature, and we'll try and answer as many as possible. And we will answer questions throughout the program as they come up, um, as they pertain to the topics at hand. We're not gonna save them all for the end. So feel free to ask throughout. Uh, if you enjoy our program today and are interested in seeing more from Missouri Humanities, Please check us out on Facebook or on our website for the most up-to-date information about our events. We also have a membership program where benefits include free books, discounted tickets to special programs, and access to members-only events. To become a member, visit www.mohumanities.org and click Memberships under the Donate tab. After our program today, I'll be sending everyone an email with a link to our program survey. I would really appreciate it if you could take some time to let us know what you thought of the presentation. These surveys are very important as we continue to bring public programming to Missourians and work toward a more thoughtful, informed, and civil society. Our discussion today will feature a conversation, of course, between myself and Dr. Arthur Mirhoff. We also have another special guest with us today. Uh, last month, we had Cindy Brown with us, who was the former site administrator for Deutschheim State Historic Site, and now we have the current site administrator. Uh, her name is Katie Holmer, and we are very excited to have her to talk about all the various things Deutschheim does to help preserve and promote Missouri's German cultural heritage. The title of our chapter today is The Enchantment of Every Day and covers topics such as German foodways, music, and recreation. If you missed any of our last discussions, here's a very brief overview of what's been covered so far. So in chapter one, it was a basic introduction to Missouri's German heritage, and we discussed many of the efforts that have been made in recent years to preserve and commemorate that heritage. During our discussion in chapter two, we were joined by Dr. Petra DeWitt, and our discussion centered around cultural identity and conflict for German Americans in Missouri. For chapter three, our discussion focused on German immigration into Missouri, specifically immigrant groups and German immigrant communities that were established. Kathy Schopenhorst, a local historian from Warren County, was our special guest. Our discussion of chapter four centered around the theme of shaping the land and the sense of place within Missouri's German heritage corridor and beyond. And finally, last month, we discussed German industries such as beer brewing, agriculture, viticulture, and more with Cindy Brown, formerly of Deutschheim State Historic Site. Whew. So if you'd like to go back and view past discussions, they are all available under the videos tab on our Facebook page, Missouri Humanities Council, as well as our YouTube channel, which is Mo Humanities Council. Now that we are all caught up, it is time to turn this over to the lovely Arthur Merhoff to introduce himself and give a little bit of an intro to Katie, and we'll uh, set the stage for our discussion. So Arthur, uh, go ahead, unmute, and we will take it there. Did you say lovely? Lovely. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm just checking, <laughs> trying to establish my context here. Um, by the last session, we'll spend most of this session reviewing the previous sessions, Caitlin. So, <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> I'd just like to start out right away by um, introducing Katie Homer as as Caitlin pointed out um, last week, or last week, <laughs> time is kind of irrelevant at this point, but uh, last month um, we had Cindy Brown, the former site administrator, and today we're having as our co-host uh, Katie Homer, the current um, site administrator. Um, I got to know Katie just briefly last year, and then things changed rather rather enormously, so we're just catching up, but 
I would like Katie to introduce herself and uh, um, I won't say anything lovely about you. I'll just say this is Katie Homer, the site administrator. And I know you have a long and varied resume, especially with Missouri uh, Department of Natural Resources, but um, what, are, what are some of the things that you bring to um, Deutschheim that uh, people can, uh, can relate to? Uh, thanks, Arthur. Yeah, um, just a little bit about my background. I um, my degrees in master's degrees in landscape architecture, specialized in, in cultural resource preservation and landscape history, and it was at the University of Wisconsin Madison. So uh, I, that kind of relates to my German uh, as well. Um, we did a lot of classes classwork in German migration to the U.S. because, of course, Wisconsin is a very German uh, state as well. Um, but uh, here at Deutschheim, we have a lot of, you know, we have a demonstration garden. We'll talk a little bit about that. And so uh, we, especially with the pandemic this year, that's probably been one of our most popular features because our gardens are open every day from sunrise to sunset. So even if the visitor center is closed, people are welcome to come and, and check out what we have. I just noticed that uh, a little note from Steve Sitton, former site administrator. I interviewed Steve a long time ago, um, might've been 2006, um, for a story I did from Missouri Life Magazine about Herman. So welcome, Steve. And uh, um, Deutschheim and uh, the, the whole state historic site has been very well served by its administrators. Um, we're very lucky in that regard. <clears throat> in talking yesterday, in previewing um, a couple days ago with Caitlin and Katie, Caitlin mentioned that there's a nostalgic feel to this chapter. And interestingly enough, the term nostalgia from Greek words, obviously everything goes back to the Greeks, um, really means longing for the lost home. And um, I was thinking about that. <clears throat> Just like Marcel Proust wrote a six volume masterpiece based on the smell of a cookie that re he reminded him of his childhood. I think there's part of that same phenomenon going here. I can still taste the uh, foods that the church ladies at Zion Lutheran Church in North St. Louis um, used to cook up, especially the green beans with bacon and, and vinegar dressing. So I'm just saying, if you're hungry, you might want to step out now and uh, get something. But there's also an aspect in which nostalgia is often seen as kind of, if you will, bottling people up or making them, you know, stuck in the past. But I also think that nostalgia can reveal some Roads not taken, to borrow from Robert Frost, and to show us new things that we've left behind that perhaps we can, you know, use again and uh, find new ways. And one section I talk about the vintage tomorrows um, that have emerged, and I think that's a good way of thinking about uh, this chapter. That I think there are things in here which we can draw upon in the future, as well as just enjoying uh, you know, what we've seen and felt and tasted in the past, because it does remind us of home. Uh, when we think of food and music and recreation, family, friends um, certainly come to mind. And I, and I think that's perf a perfectly good way to think about Missouri's German heritage if you will, the Gemütlichkeit that uh, often characterized those, those relationships. And I also wanted to <clears throat> mention, you know, Katie said that there's a lot packed in here and there is, um, in fact, part of the problem is that Missouri's German heritage is so vast and, and the German heritage corridor is so large that we really needed to find a way to condense that. And so, in, in each essay in this chapter, we take one particular artifact, which anyone who's interested in exploring Missouri's German heritage could go and see, you know, could go to see the Franz Zither um, exhibit in Washington. You can go to Deutschheim and uh, enjoy the, um, you know, the four square garden. Um, you can sit at the Frederick Jan Memorial in Forest Park 
And so it, it's part of our everyday landscape. It's, it's available to us, but sometimes we don't realize how much uh, these things represent. And so I'm, I'm really excited to have Katie with us to help us unpack to a certain extent um, these incredible art artifacts. Um, each one tells um, a sto many stories, actually. So, uh, um, Caitlin, you better get us started on these stories. <laughs> better cut you off. <laughs> cut me off. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, this is a super fun chapter. Um, who doesn't like talking about food, music, and activity? I like that, you know, I feel like for a lot of the first several chapters, we were talking about broader things and trying to establish context. And um, now we're getting into some really specific things, and I think it's really fun. Um, so I think the first thing we'll talk about, obviously, is the first essay, which is about um, German foodways. And uh, that's a, kind of a perfect place to get Katie involved. Um, so we talk about German foodways as cultural artifacts and their lasting impact. So let's talk a little bit about that. And I think um, what we could do is have Katie, I'll start with some of the pictures that you shared. And you could talk a little bit about how Deutschheim um, tries to interpret and successfully interprets uh, and uh, exhibits German foodways. So uh, I'll have you kind of take it from there and yeah. describe this lovely picture for us. <laughs> this, is, um, this is the picture of the back of the Palmer House, which is one of our homes here at Joy Time. Um, you'll notice the lot is pretty, the lot is about 120 feet by 60 feet, which was the standard um, share that somebody bought. And pardon me, my phone decided to leave. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. I activated Siri earlier and I had to like quickly shut her up. <laughs> I, no, I haven't gotten any phone calls all week and then it happened. <laughs> Sorry, so it's uh, 120 feet by 60 feet. So that was the standard uh, share to purchase it for the German Settlement Society of Philadelphia, which established Herman. And what you'll notice a lot of the homes, early homes here in Herman, like um, the Palmer House was built in 1840. And it is the, the home, the sidewalk. So it allows a large backyard, which you can have uh, then have a nice garden and even maybe have some small animals. The barn there was done at a much later date. Um, now let's see what we else. talk. Well, people today, there's a big deal about keeping chickens um, in a place <laughs> like Columbia. Well, that's not new, folks. I was one of the many people that started keeping chickens during the pandemic. I've got chickens right. now. <laughs> and, and here's a here's a close up of the garden. So. I spent a lot, we spent a lot of time outside and featuring our garden last year for people during times we were, we weren't offering tours during the pandemic. It was actually hard to find some of our normal heirloom seeds that we would get, the other sources, as you all probably know, if you are gardeners or started gardening this year, a lot of places were out of seeds this year. Luckily we had some that we collected or had some leftovers. So we were able to, to make do this year. Um, and this is early June, and you can see it's it's going pretty good, especially the lettuces. But if uh, Caitlin wants to go ahead and show the next slide, it's just three weeks later, and you'll see like how much the tomatoes grow and um, and everything. So it's quite a quite a jump there. But this four square design, um, I believe, as it mentions in the chapter, uh, goes back to like medieval monasteries and even like the Romans um, all brought that to Germany, and um, the Germans liked. The four square design, it allowed them to rotate their crops um, to help improve the nutrition of the soil. It also gives you easy access to the garden, whether so you don't get your your, your wooden shoes muddy um, because you can reach the garden without like you know tracing through the mud. So you can have either a mulch or maybe a, a gravel pathway uh, or even bricks perhaps. Um, and that gives and it's also just an aesthetically nice design. And you also see that we have the garden close to the house um, that gives you easy access for your kitchen. It's also important in terms of not compacting the soil, which is really the starting point for any healthy, healthy garden. So these things were thought out over time, weren't they? Yeah. Um, and somebody would, uh, sorry, I got distracted by a question there. So um, hopefully someone can see the screens now. This is, uh, this is really late in the season. This is, um, 
September. And I don't know if you see those tall red plants, that's a red orc. It's a, a specialty that we have to collect the seeds from, but those were all volunteers this year. And we decided to just let them be in the garden so we could collect the seeds for, for this year. Um, <laughs> because- Are those, uh, those Amaran? Yes, 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 they're in that family. And they um, uh, they were usually grown like a, kind of like a, a, a salad. They're very bitter though. So I, um, but uh, we, we decided we just let them grow where they were. Um, and collect the seeds. So, because they're very hard to find the seeds for. We also have the flowers. Um, use, things like marigolds would be integrated. Again, the Germans often were called Latin gardeners because they were very much into the, the research of it. And of course, back then everything was written in Latin. All the science, uh, science about agriculture was written in Latin. And so they would use marigolds to keep away some of the like nematodes and other uh, pests from their gardens. It hasn't always looked like this though. And no. that's, that's one of the important things I think people need to realize is there was a lot of archeology span that went into the restoration of what looks like a flat two dimensional um, square, but that took place over many years. And uh, um, it's a great achievement. I hope people will appreciate that. Yes. Um, I, I'm so lucky to have so many former site administrators that are watching us <laughs> right now because there's such a wealth of knowledge with each administrator brings something different. Um, Dr. Erin Wren, one of the earliest administrators, um, she had a lot of garden knowledge and, and was a, an expert in, in that field. So she really helped bring about this four square garden and, and help restore it. So, but yeah, we still rotate the crops um, because, um, you know, sometimes if we grow that red, uh, orc in the same spot, it, it tends to take, take up too much nutrients. So it's important to move it around. It can get pretty tall, can't they? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looked a little crazy there in the fall. And of course, here's a here's a cabbage, which is, we talk about food waste, is a very important crop for the Germans. They generally would grow, I believe, 100 head of cabbage per person per year. So um, obviously, they probably had uh, other areas of land because that would take up a lot of space in your garden to, to grow that for everybody. Um, but if you know everyone likes still uses make eat sauerkraut around here. Um, so that's an important uh, kind of artifact that goes from that time period. Um, and again, there's a German uh, pink tomato. So that's one of those heirloom varieties. Um, like I said, we try to try to keep those uh, German heirloom varieties going here. And, um, and another thing uh, I think you mentioned, Ar Arthur, in the in the article is um, or in the chapter, are, are fruits. Like the Germans really liked the seasonal fruits, and these are heirloom peach, uh, the flowers of an heirloom peach tree. Um, and you can see a bigger tree in the background there, behind near the barn. And if you go to the next slide, you can see the peaches that are um, as they're about to ripen. They, it was quite overloaded last year. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, I will say real quick, someone uh, wanted to hear that again. Uh, did you say a hundred heads of cabbage per person per year? That's what I understand. I, that's what I think, Arthur, did you, I think you mentioned so, that. I think I cited at Dr. A um, Aaron McCauley or, was, or Wren. I, Wren. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, had uh, written extensively about um, the German foodways and uh <clears throat> But I can believe it, how much sauerkraut, you know, how much cabbage do you need to make sauerkraut all the time? Well, and the, I mean, it compacts down, so it takes quite a bit. And, that, and well, Steve yeah. Sitton actually, Steve Sitton uh, confirms that he remembers that fact as well. <laughs> and uh, I mean, cabbage was a, a very easy vegetable to grow. It took up a lot of room, but it was easy to grow and it's hearty. And, uh, and, stores, and yeah. well, stores well, which yes, becomes yeah. important. Yeah. It's, it's, and they also, they would have probably grow it like on vacant lots in town, you know, that probably would have had kind of like what we would call a, a community garden today. They would have had areas like that with communal spaces to grow, things like that. And there were, you know, farmers in the area as well who had, like if you had a share of 120 by 60 feet in town, you'd get 40 acres out of town if you were a farmer. So that share was, you know, different amount of land if you were outside of the city. So. Mm -hmm. You talk, you show those beautiful, uh, Mm -hmm. apple trees and <clears throat> it brings to mind this this what we call intercultural transfer um, throughout our German heritage corridor discussions 
and did a little more research about food. Why not? And it, uh, <laughs> we use the term American as apple pie, but um, quite a few food waste experts would say, if you look at uh, um, German, um, was it up, up, Apfel tort or Apfelkuchen, and uh, uh, there's a champagne tort from the um, French German Alsace uh, region. And uh, the Apfelkuchen, I believe, is uh, of Austrian descent, but they're not that so heavy and rich, and sugary as ours, that uh, in fact they're much lighter. And so uh, <clears throat> there's a connection between. <laughs> what we think of as American cuisine, the American diet, and um, <clears throat> also keep in, I think people need to keep in mind that the image of German cuisine as starchy, heavy meat, potatoes, um, part of that has to do with the image that we get from Bavaria. And a lot of those associations um, come from the fact that um, US, military liberate in the southern part of Germany, but the rest of Germany has a, I wouldn't say very different cuisine. There are continuities, but many different regional varieties all the way up to uh, um, seafood, you know, in the northern parts and a lot of, a lot of emphasis on vegetables, on uh, herbs, etc. So I mentioned um, Mimi Sheraton's famous um, German cookbook, and if people want to know a little bit more about uh, the wide ver variety, diversity of German cuisine, that's an excellent source to uh, to explore and just celebrated its 50th anniversary, so it's got a good pedigree. We do have a question from Norman. Um, were there any commercial nurseries that would sell fruit trees in Hermann between the Civil War and the 1920s? Does anybody know? I don't know about that time period. Um, of course, jo George Hussman would have been doing it at an earlier time period, but I'm not sure about that time period. Okay. And I'm having internet trouble, so I don't know if you can hear me. I can hear you okay. Came across fine, Katie. Okay. Okay. Arthur, do you have any, any knowledge? I don't, I don't know whether um, George Hussman continued his, the nursery after um, the Civil War, his partner was killed during the Civil War um, and Hussman moved on to, to other things. But I'm pretty sure that Hussman literally cultivated um, the, uh, <laughs> the fruit tree industry. So I'm, I would be very surprised if there weren't sources, but like you, I'm, I'm not familiar with any specific places. And then he follows up with, um, did any did most farmers know how to graft or bud trees? Um, I mean, I know George Hussman would have known how to graft uh, <laughs> grapevines grape because yeah. he's known for that. Um, <laughs> but uh, I don't know about you know a typical farmer. Yeah, maybe. Again, yeah, again, the work of Dr. Uh, Aaron Wren is an excellent source, either in the Der Maibaum articles or in Missouri Historical Review. Yeah, and uh, our own uh, Linda Walker Stevens, she's one of our guides here who's been here since Erin uh, Wren was the administrator and she's a George Hussman scholar. So I kind of wish she was on the panel today. She would, she would probably know that answer right away. <laughs> Um, Katie, I, I'm sorry, I'm kind of going through some of your pictures here. Um, yeah, it's hard for, I, I'm down to a little miniature screen now, so I think my internet slowed down. <laughs> so, um, um, I, yeah, I, I wanted to get to a point that we made during our getting the kids involved. Is it potatoes that they're picking? Yeah, yeah. I think so. <laughs> um, we talked about, uh, hello, Arthur. <laughs> Cheers. Uh, the, <laughs> I froze the, it. The local cookbooks, church cookbooks and oh, stuff yes. as cultural artifacts as well. Um, and I know that, uh, yeah, here we go. Um, all the various cookbooks that were mostly local, mostly church and family recipes and how those, you know, being passed down, being shared are such a major cultural artifact. Um, and clearly Deutschheim, you know, I know they sell quite a few. Yeah, we sell a few. These are a few in our own uh, library um, that I just 
put it out on the table and you know when you take books off the shelf and they don't take up that much space and then you spread them out on the table you realize how many you have um but yeah somewhere in german um i the one that cracks me up the most is it's american cookies but it's a it's in German, so I have to <laughs> that. A good uh, example, yeah. <laughs> but there, there are several um, from Pennsylvania, Ohio, Iowa, Missouri, um, and like you said, several church cookbooks are, mm -hmm. are some of the best, richest resources for um, great recipes and in and, and the, these cultural traditions. I wanted to ask Caitlin whether in the oral histories that cookbooks and cooking have emerged in some of the, the narratives. Oh yes, actually, when you uh, when you mentioned the green beans with the ham or the bacon, <laughs> that uh, it calls to Anita Mallinckrodt's oral history because one thing that I've heard her say on more than one occasion is that she cannot stand green beans because <laughs> of how frequently they were served at every single church picnic, every meal was green beans. And I mean, you could just, the disgust in her voice when she talks about the green beans is hilarious. So, so yeah, it comes up. Food is, is such a, um, a pillar of culture that, you know, you can't talk about, you know, culture without talking about food. Um, so this is Marie. Marie mentioned, you mentioned where these cookbooks were created in various states. Um, I've learned an aunt in Oregon, she has an aunt that lived in Oregon. Are any of these cookbooks created in Oregon? I know don't of. believe I saw any of them from Oregon. No, they were more Midwestern and in Pennsylvania. Okay. And we have one more question, I think, before we'll move on to our next topic. Um, someone asks uh, if wooden shoes were worn by Germans to work in the garden. Is that accurate? Absolutely. From what I understand, even I think, and Arthur may know this, like I think they wore them in the breweries into the 20th century. Um, they keep your feet dry and, and warm and protected. Um, a little bit, you know, not quite like a steel toed boot, but they still give you some safety protection as well. And it, everyone thinks they're uncomfortable, but they would have been carved to, to meet your feet. You know, you would have mm -hmm. had a, a shoemaker make them to fit your feet. So they probably kind were of, more comfortable. <laughs> yeah, kind of heavy duty flip flops, really. Right. <laughs> easy to... Crocs yeah. nowadays. <laughs> And weren't they, weren't a lot of them made to fit over a boot or a shoe that you were already wearing too? So they were even more protective. Yeah, I actually have a, I should have taken a picture of that. We have some large ones that everyone thinks are for giants, but they're kind of like a galosh. You would just right. flip them over your leather shoe, so. We'll slip in one more question because it's about green beans. <laughs> um, <laughs> Joy says, when I went to Germany for the first time, I realized that I've been eating a lot of German cooking all my life. Those green beans with bacon and vinegar were what helped me realize that. And I think that's the point Arthur was making earlier, you know, the whole as American as apple pie really is kind of not true because there's so many foods that we consider our daily, you know, ordinary foods or even very American foods, hamburgers, hot dogs, apple pie, all of those, you know, kind of the three big ones Long have produced. roots in German cuisine. <laughs> and keep in mind that the most popular cookbook in America has historically been Joy of Cooking. First published in 1931 by um, Irma Rombauer. And, yeah. You know, guess where she got a lot of her recipes. <laughs> that was my first cookbook. So. <laughs> yep, I, my mom has multiple copies because they all just shred apart because she uses them so much. <laughs> all right. So on to uh, this interesting looking instrument. Um, so this is a zither. Um, so let's discuss this a little bit more. How... This unique instrument, the zither, impacted Washington, Missouri, um, and beyond. So there's, you know, we had, there were national festivals that brought attention to this little town in mid-Missouri, and, and this manufacturer, the Schwarzer, right? Schwarzer? Schwarzer. Schwarzer in Washington. Schwarzer. They created these instruments for people <laughs> worldwide. Um, so let's talk about the zither and its cultural impact. I would like to use this Schwarzer zither as an example of artifact analysis, um, spent a long time working in museums and taking an artifact like this, um, there are basically four key questions to, uh, to address. You know, first of all, what is it? Describe it in as best you can, as fully as you can. Then look at um, how was it created, for whom was it created? Uh, <clears throat> you know, who would be the audience for this? 
then look at the, uh, the meanings associated with it. Uh, what did it mean to the maker, to the, uh, to the audience? And then finally, does it have any meaning for us today? What can it say to us today? And uh, obviously, as, as one person, I think uh, somebody from the Washington uh, um, History Museum said, it's like playing three guitars at once. It's a complex, unique musical instrument. And this, most people would say this is a work of art. And, uh, and there, in, therein lies a tale because for most of the 19th century, this would be the instrument of choice for German families. This was a household instrument. So they would not look this elaborate. It would not have inlaid rose, you know, rosewood and inlaid mother of pearl, et cetera. So something has changed and this has become almost like um, a work of folk art, a, a connoisseur's thing. And that also reflects what happened to the, the zither in America as German in Missouri Americanized, the younger generation decided that they would rather do the hip hop of their time than play the old tunes. And so the, uh, the zither became something of an instrument for um, connoisseurs like Franz Schwarzer, who had a background in design and woodworking. Um, his wife was an actress at arts training. So they uh, made it for people who already knew how to play the zither and would appreciate to this but uh, um, it kind of lost its meaning by, as the instrument of choice for Germans in America and Missouri by the time of that uh, great um, Congress in the early 1900s. And after that time, it zithers, you know, might show up in a symphony orchestra somewhere or in performances, but um, kind of disappeared from the stage for the most part until, as uh, Mark Hausman pointed out, this great um, gathering in Washington, Missouri, where zither enthusiasts and uh, artisans from all over the world came together to kind of celebrate its heritage. And since then, there's been kind of a revival of um, zither playing zithers uh, not just as an individual, but collectively um, in Washington and growing out from there. So I think that in this one little artifact, well, not so little perhaps, that uh, we can see a lot of those themes and trends in um, Missouri's German heritage illustrated in one very beautiful artifact. Um, Katie, what um, I know you have zithers at um, Deutschheim, and you also have uh, music concerts, or did have um, prior to the pandemic. Yeah, um, yeah this is the this the, the, there is in our is uh, on display at our site um, in our room with our where pianos were actually manufactured, but we do have this, and we tie it into that the rest of the German community, the greater German community in Missouri, um, and it is a beautiful instrument. I mean, the detail I, I should share a close up, but yeah, that's mother of pearl inlay. Um, and there's, I believe, some ivory on it as well. Um, and if you, um, yeah, I just can't imagine. I didn't, I, I couldn't even picture. I had to look up how it's played because it, it's so complicated. Because I, I didn't quite understand the fretboard. But I, from what I understand, you use your left hand on the fretboard there at the bottom of the screen, and your right hand strums all the other, strums all the other strings. So um, it's quite, like you said, playing three guitars at once. So <laughs> um, we have. We do have someone that asks about the size of it um, compared to a guitar. Um, from the ones I've seen, sometimes they can be very big, um, yeah. but they don't have that long neck that a guitar has. It's one yeah. piece. Um, and I would say, I mean, the one that you've got there, just by looking at the tuning keys, probably maybe the size of like the body of a guitar, maybe a little smaller, but not, but without well, the neck. It's actually larger than a guitar body. This one's Oh, is it? Oh, yeah. wow. Um, this is, There's yeah, this kind is of a market. kind of a related family of instruments. Uh, I think Norman asked a question about the mandolin. The auto harp is is related. Um, 
probably a, a looter um, might be one of the origins of it. So I, I couldn't answer the question of the exact line of descent, but certainly they're within the same family of stringed instruments. And do you, I, oh, sorry, oh, I was gonna say, do, so the same person asked, do you sit it in your lap or do you hold it up like a guitar? How do you play it? I've never seen one performed live, so. You can lay it down flat, kind of like, like a dulcimer or, or, or like more like an auto harp or something. I think, I think it depends on the size of the instrument, but generally I think it'll be laying flat, so. There's also a picture in the chapter of the, uh, um, the Zither Club at um, Washington, in Washington, and they, looks like they have it held you know, upright. But again, like an auto harp, you can play it flat or well, guitar, same thing like with a steel guitar, but. Uh, oh yeah, I don't know if you can. That's in the book there. So all different sizes, different shapes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're talking about the zithers, right? Yeah. Yeah, all right. I think, yeah, I think they're standing, they're just holding them. So I'm not sure they're actually playing them. There is a picture of a lady on the other page and she's playing it on her lap. So. Yeah, the older, the older photo. Yeah, right here. She's on, and on her lap. I understand, yeah, you would hold, uh, your left hand would be doing the fret chords and that left thumb would have like a pick on it and you mm -hmm. drum those bottom strings with that. And then your right hand does all the upper strings. So. Mm -hmm. Katie, do you often have people that come in and do they know what that is? Have they ever seen a zither before? I'm gonna just mention, actually, yeah. I had a young, well, a woman, I believe she was probably a college or graduate student studying here in the States um, from Germany. And the way you say zither in German is, is more like zitar. So I think it might be the origin of the word guitar. I don't, don't quote me on that, but someone else might know that. Um, so it sounds more like guitar, zitar, when, they, when she said it. I'm, I'm sorry, my German is not that good. Uh, <laughs> but um, she said, I asked her if they were very common and she said, oh, like in the, in the country with like folk instruments, you know, and, and she mentioned like, I said accordion, but she probably really meant like a concertina. You know, she was like a squeeze, a squeeze box. So I think they're probably a, a, a rarity. We, it's one of those cases where we might have more players here in the United States, I suspect, than mm -hmm. Maybe, I don't know for sure, but um, like you said, with the resurgence, I think in uh, here in Washington, and I believe the Quad Cities uh, of the Midwest also has a zither group as well. So there's a few little pockets here in the US that still play the zither. Mm -hmm. oh, I see the like comment from Bob Steyert mm -hmm. or Steert um, that back in the 50s in St. Louis, there would be zither, zitar concerts, and uh, that they were played flat so, uh, um, yes, and yeah, Sylvia, lots of, lots of it, um, yeah. and Krista mentions that zithers are played in the Alpine regions and they are a folk instrument. Okay, and mm -hmm. I think Sylvia asked about that. That is the turning, uh, the tuning key at the, mm -hmm. at the top there. So, mm -hmm. I think we got I wanted to right. mention, yeah, I wanted oh. to mention that, um, <clears throat> What they've done when in hot Washington, Missouri, in interpreting the, the zithers, um, I think is exemplary. It's a great, you know, having looked at a lot of and worked on a lot of museum exhibitions, um, I think it's outstanding in the way that it, it provides a wide range of perspectives on this artifact. And, uh, you know, besides the finished instrument, which is for instruments, which are beautiful in their own right, um, they have an exhibition about the uh, the process. You can almost just kind of sit in on the um, the artisan making these these instruments. Um, there's a, a video. There's uh, um, you know various other artifacts that enable people um, you know exhibitions showing pictures to uh, to help people see see the thing in itself. And just like you do in uh, Deutschheim State Historic Site, interpreting it through the actual music itself, like in the uh, so-called Palmer concerts. Um, you know, it's one thing to, to talk about or look at an instrument. It's another thing to play it and hear it played. And uh, I don't know if you'd want to say anything about the Palmer concerts. 
Yeah, I was um, going to say we can transition to, you know, you know, Zithers is obviously one representation of, of the impact of German music and, and you know, but Katie works with um, the fact that it's the Palmer House and talking a little bit about who William Palmer was and how it relates to this yeah. magnificent piano we've got on our screen. The, the Palmer family, uh, Carl and Carolina, Carl and his sons were piano manufacturers in Philadelphia, and they were early members of the settlement society that uh, settled Herman. Unfortunately, Carl died before he got to Herman um, in a typhoid epidemic, um, but uh, we, uh, my predecessor, Cindy Brown, was able to acquire this lovely piano uh, made by Carl Palmer in um, Philadelphia, and the next slide shows a little more detail that Mother Pearl inlay, and you see he actually said both by Charles Palmer there, so he probably made it for an English speaking client um, or, or perhaps but it's just beautiful detail work. So we're so lucky, so fortunate to have that, um, that piano, even though it wasn't made here, it was made by the Palmer family. Now, a couple years later, um, Cindy got a phone call from someone in St. Louis who had a piano that was actually made here in Herman. And the next slide shows that piano that we now have. Um, and it is a, a little more simple piece, but it's actually made by Carl and Carolina's son, Frederick William Palmer. And you mentioned his, his, his son was William Henry Palmer, who eventually helped establish the music department at the University of Missouri in Columbia, I believe. Oh. Um, and we've had Palmer concerts of his music. So when we're, when we're in this room interpreting it, we actually play William Henry Palmer's music in the background, his composition. So growing up with his father making pianos and furniture, um, you know, that probably influenced him and he became a great uh, composer himself. So he not only wrote um, like piano pieces, he also wrote um, uh, operettas that were in German because he would have been, he grew up actually in St. Louis, the family. Obviously there wasn't a big market for pianos here in Herman for the, the city never got that big. So they eventually moved to St. Louis, but um, uh, we're so lucky to, to have these two lovely pianos in our collection. Since the name of this chapter is Altog's Culture or Everyday Culture, I, if people are like me, there's probably a soundtrack of your life. And if you think, you know, if you think about it, you can recall the music mm -hmm. at different stages of your life. And this was especially true, I think, for um, Missouri Germans. Um, you know, the old German saying, music washes away from the soul, the dust of everyday life. I would imagine out there in the far West that uh, that would be very important for people, you know, ranging from Mozart and Beethoven and Brahms to polkas and marches and operettas and uh, you know, folk, folk music. But <clears throat> it's sometimes I think we, we miss a, a beat in interpretation by not having the soundtrack that people would have um, going on regularly, but who's gonna play it? Uh, I think that's part of the issue, but it's another dimension of interpretation that I think is, is valuable. And then I wanted to share one anecdote that Mark Hausman uh, from Washington shared with me. If you remember the, the play Sister Act or the movie where, um, you know, the jazz singer running away from gangsters and holds up in a, in a convent and uh, kind of gets the uh, sisters engaged in different kinds of music. <laughs> Mark showed me some of the, where the zithers were, were sold. And for a long time, there was a uh, pretty steady stream from, I think it was the Sisters of Notre Dame in Chicago, but certain point, um, and he said because, and he, they found out later that the sisters became, novitiates became so obsessed with playing the zither that um, mother superior said, no, we need to tone this down a bit. So the orders kind of um, went away. But that point well taken there is that eventually only people who had a lot of time on their hands, um, like novitiates in a convent, uh, would probably be learning something as complex um, as the zither instrument. <laughs> so Katie, um, any, uh, any of these other images you want me to pull up before we move on to the turnverein topic? This is, yeah, this kind of, 
I think I didn't realize this connection and maybe Arthur can make it a little more. Um, the Turnverines, I guess were post-Civil War, but I guess they have their origins in a lot of the revolutions and things that were going on in Europe. Um, uh, and I didn't realize that kind of political connection to that. So this is- Well, after, after, Na yeah, after Napoleon marched through, uh, uh, they began to realize we might need to uh, prepare for people marching either you know, from the east or from the west, but uh, they they had a very sort of liberal um, democracy um, origin, revolutionary origins. Um, people like Paul Philanius, for example, um, uh, Friedrich Munch, um, who we looked at earlier, um, grew out of, I think grew out of that tradition. I think it's fair to say they grew out of that tradition, not necessarily the Turnverein, but that spirit, um, kind of almost American revolutionary spirit. And uh, so the Turnverein played a big role in the American Civil War, as we saw earlier, but its roots go back uh, much further. And, you know, Fatur Jan, uh, Friedrich Jan, was a catalyst for that movement, whose you know, he's the stone that, you know, hit the water and the ripples just continue to, to flow out from that. Yeah, and this quote is from Edward Buell. He was the newspaper editor for the newspaper that was published here at the site. Um, uh, and, and so the, this kind of ties in, a lot of them came from this revolutionary experience in, in Europe and um, they didn't like to, you know, they felt really suppressed back in, in, their, germ, in their homeland. So they didn't like to see that other people being suppressed here in America. So they, like you said, a lot of these, eventually um, a lot of these men became involved with the keeping Missouri in the union during the civil war and helping form the um, regiments there out of St. Louis to help help protect Missouri, um, you know, during the civil war. And that uh, the newspaper is known to be an abolitionist newspaper, um, right. not just a paper that sometimes posted about anti-slavery, but right. full-blown <laughs> abolitionist newspaper. Um, and that, uh, Arthur, what were you going to say? Arthur. I was going to say that the Turnverein were the core of the core, <laughs> the, um, the Army Corps, of that the German um, soldiers, I think, who, who showed up. Um, in on mass, I mean, and Lincoln himself said, oh, we, "We probably owe, um, well, besides, um, you know, freed slaves or even slaves who came to um, fight um, and help turn the tide, that the German troops were essential to uh, the Union cause." And kind of as we continue on with the the Turnbrine topic. Um, we we're using the term turnverein and, and I don't think we've really defined it yet. So Arthur, do you want to talk a little bit about what a turnverein is? And um, I think in a broader sense, why it was so much more than just a place for activity or recreation and what is the cultural significance of a turnverein? Well, um, it's, it was part of a response to the Napoleonic the wars, the, uh, the wars and the early part of the, the 19th century, um, the Rhine associations um, in German turning to tumble or turn. And so uh, it was gymnastics, it was physical education, but it was also, in a sense, um, preparing young men for military service, um, organizing, drilling, um, the Schutzen, the, the shooting societies, um, so yes, it was um, sociable and it helped to uh, bind people together, but it really did grow out of this revolutionary um, ideology of the time, which Americans should understand best of all, because in a sense, we're the ones who exported it to, uh, to Europe, um, intercultural transfer again. And so uh, when they came to uh, Missouri, when it came to America, the term Verein were, was one way in which you could associate with people like yourselves um, <clears throat> and sing the old songs. You know. um, there was a certain amount of drinking involved, I think it's fair to say, and uh, um, 
that it kept the culture alive in the face of, as we saw later, uh, kind of widespread resistance. Mm -hmm. And I think what's interesting too is that we've got examples that they're not exactly called a turn variety to this day, but emote the same goal of kind of, of maintaining a culture and, and being amongst people that share your culture. And, you know, we've got the, the Deutschheim Verein, which is a, a current um, group that, that works, you know, with um, immediately with, you know, Deutschheim State Historic Site, but in the broader sense of, of German cultural heritage, um, not just in Hermann, but throughout the state. Um, and then we've got the Harmony Verein building actually in Augusta that still stands that was built um, I believe in the 1890s in uh, Augusta, and um, now is a uh, I think is a it was it became an American Legion Hall I think you know as as many buildings do and um, but it, what it started off was it was basically a club it was a place for you to go and be German um, and I think you know because you know I joke with Arthur that we can't get through a talk without talking about World War One and World War Two but um, that you know during times of of great turmoil especially for Germans, um, this it was a place to be able to celebrate your culture. And uh, those places and those ideas, you know, come to modern day. And uh, so I think that it all kind of comes together as, you know, the turn of rhymes and, you know, being a place to be German and being, a you know, having a place that um, emotes your culture and, and, you know, and builds ideas and feeling and nostalgia and <laughs> all these great themes that we keep talking about. Um, and the turn of kind of, um, emitted all of that. Um, Bob Steyer mentioned belonging to or attending a Turner Club in the 40s and 50s. And uh, <clears throat> I shared an anecdote, you know, playing against the Concordia Turners who were <laughs> renowned for their athletic prowess. Certainly gymnastics was a foundation, but um, they became more of a well, kind of like a YMCA, I guess, but uh, um, the, the legend was true as I discovered. So uh, um, they, they were formidable in many um, athletic endeavors, but especially gymnastics. And uh, Tina asks if it's called a Turner Club. Um, yeah, I think we talked about in our, our practice discussion yeah. that um, kind of a more modern thing that was called as a Turner Club or a Turner Hall. Katie mentions having a Turner Hall. I think you said growing up. Right. Well, in Wisconsin, when I lived in Wisconsin. Oh, Wisconsin, yeah. Uh, they're pretty prevalent there. And, and they're not just gymnastics, but they're like event centers. So you can rent mm -hmm. them out for weddings and um, other things like that. So mm -hmm. there were the, the, the uh, Missouri Historical Museum in St. Louis um, had a wonderful series about the Turnverein and had a map showing their locations. and how it sort of began toward the downtown area where most immigrants would have clustered. And then you could see how they uh, moved out as the German American population moved out and assimilated. And eventually as a place like uh, um, Concordia Turners in South St. Louis, the highway came through and so they were forced to move even further out. But uh, they, they still retain some of those elements. I think you can see it on the you know the walls of the uh, the place. You can see the trophies, uh, um, you know, and many things written in German. And my guess, well, I can uh, the uh, Concordia Turners on uh, Bravoy, I believe that uh, it's, it incorporates the old Black Forest Inn, where I'm sure some some viewers here will remember that uh, for doing the chicken dance and <laughs> stuff like that. Um, and I think, you know, we've got only got uh, about five minutes left. Um, let's transition into kind of a, what I think is a good wrap up question, which Arthur mentioned as he kind of introduced us about the nostalgia of these three essays um, and that they all kind of, he, he mentioned um, that they call back to our own past and help us find continued meaning and value. So I would like to talk a little bit about what we think it is about these three themes, which have simplified them to basically food, music, and activity. Um, what is it that inspires that feeling? And kind of as we, I'm not sure how many pictures are left, Katie, but I'll kind of go through them just so people can at least have some visuals of Herman and, and other German things. Um, but feel free to stop me if you've got one that 
you want to talk about. But yeah, let's talk about nostalgia and what what that link is to these kind of three essays. Um, whoever wants to start. I think the food is for me. I didn't realize till we were we were preparing for this talk that um, out of all my like family members that cooked, it was my my German grandmother. I think of I didn't ever really think of her as being German, but she, you know that's where she, she came from. She was born in Pennsylvania and. Hoffman was her main name and um, it's just I realized oh she was the really good cook and she was these sweets we had at Christmas and things that I, now I think of were probably German in origin so I you know those are your happy memories of you know holiday times and things I think food definitely the smells and the taste of food is and the love from your grandma. <laughs> yeah some people some anthropologists would suggest that the key to the path to cultural diversity is through the stomach. And I think most of us who've been to fairs and festivals um, can, can relate to that. You tried food from, from all over the place. And uh, um, there's just kind of a sense of goodwill, I believe, if I can use that term, that uh, can prevail. But uh, also the you know, how these things came about, the more questions we ask of people, or why is this important to you, or, you know, how did, how did it come through your family? They're, those are great lines of, don't even think of it as research, it's just sharing our common humanity. I do have a picture of Joseph Pilates on my wall, so uh, <laughs> uh, talk about cultural continuity, that, um, you know, the roots of Joseph Pilates go way back, and and even his, in his writings, he's quoting um, the ancient Greeks whom Friedrich Jan, Vater Jan, um, you know, embodied in his motto. And it's on that uh, memorial in Forest Park. So uh, the more things change, the more they remain the same. It's kind of like as American as apple pie. <laughs> well, and I think what's, you know, someone commented on the Facebook uh, video of this, making a similar comment about food that, you know, it wasn't until, you know, talking a lot about the food ways that we've been doing for the last hour, it's, you know, um, realizing how cultural food is. And, you know, I, I replied to her comment and I said, you know, I challenge you to think of a, a cultural event, whether it be a community event or a family gathering where food is not involved. There's something inherently comforting, cultural, social about food that, um, that has not changed over time. Um, and I think that's, that's interesting. Um, but what about, what about music? What about the, and we talked a little bit more, I think, in the, in the part about the turn grinds that how, you know, to this day we can call back to, you know, the Turner halls that I remember seeing growing up, Turner groups or, um, you know, anything like that. But, um, you know, one little anecdote for me is the zithers. I actually had a zither growing up, but it was not, it was not oh. anything like that kind of zither. It was like a little kid zither. It was just a little like, um, parallelogram looking thing and had just strings across, but it was, it was called a zither. And it was like a child zither. I have no idea why I had it. I think it was something that my parents thought I would find fun, but you know, that's what I think of when I think of zither. It's, you know, I had one of those as a kid and it was, you know, a fun little instrument I learned to play. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, I, I, anything else from you guys on that? For me, I grew up in a very musical family. My Mother and her sisters actually sang on the radio, had a program on the radio back then, I guess in the 30s. So I grew up surrounded by, um, met, much of the music was of German origin. It's a lot of church music, but uh, a lot of the operettas, etc. You know, think of our, you know, the bandstands in places like Herman and, and throughout the German Heritage Corridor, that reflects um, a love of music uh, as part of everyday life. And we need to think about what we're putting into our souls through, through music because it affects us. I mean, it's designed to affect people. And uh, so you know, what, what's out there that from our German, Missouri's German heritage that you know, might be uh, worth feeding our souls? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, Arthur, you mentioned that music being the sound the soundtrack of our lives. And <laughs> my mom played piano and she was in a reporter group, which is 
you know, goes back to medieval times. <laughs> so, um, and then, um, and she's still in that today. Um, and then uh, my sister played violin and I played trumpet. So yeah, we, there was always music besides records. I, I Yesterday was Carol King's 50th anniversary for Tapestry album. So that's something I remember. <laughs> that's <laughs> great. <up>, so. <laughs> One more comment from a participant and then I'll wrap us up. Um, Bob also mentioned the Ethnic Heritage Festival every summer. And Casey, I've heard of this. I've heard it's amazing. Um, they have booths selling ethnic food from 40 to 60 different countries. Of course, there's a German booth. And he says all are delicious. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> um, so I, I will wrap it up. We're right at 11 o'clock. And I like to keep these concise so you guys can go about your days. Um, but I, I do want to thank Arthur and Katie for a fun discussion of all these different cultural artifacts that and I loved hearing all of your guys' personal anecdotes, um, especially, you know, the comments from you guys, our participants. Um, those are the best part of these programs is hearing, you know, your thoughts, your opinions, your stories. So thank you for those of you that submitted questions and comments. Um, our next program is March 11th, Thursday, March 11th at 10 a.m. Um, I believe our guest will be Mark Hausman, who we mentioned today as uh, the uh, executive director of the Washington Museum and Historical Society. Um, and that'll be a, a really good program as well. So March 11th at 10 a.m. is our next one. And then after that, we've just got one left. It's almost over. <laughs> Time flies, <laughs> but uh, maybe not so, maybe, maybe Arthur disagrees. <laughs> it kind of depends on your perspective because you know, day to day, it seems pretty long. <laughs> I, yeah, I know. All right, everybody. Well, I hope you guys have a great day. Please keep an eye out for that survey um, email. We really appreciate those comments. I don't ignore surveys. I take everything seriously. I read everybody's comments. So uh, please be honest. Please give us uh, your thoughts. And uh, I will look forward to seeing all of you uh, in about exactly a month, March 11th. Any final words, Arthur, Katie? Gut essen und gut drinken. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> good eating and good drinking. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, everybody. Krista says, Dr. Shane. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. We'll talk to you Bye. next month.